Good morning, everyone, and welcome. As you are joining us, please take the poll that's going to be showing up on your screen and we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. Thank you everyone for your responses. We're closing the poll now and Professor Pooley, better known as Pooley, will discuss the results of the poll later on in this program. So let's get started. My name is Jill Libby and I'm a director of state and local tax at PwC. On behalf of PwC and the chamber, we hope you're joining us today feeling both safe and healthy. Today's program is part of our new Skill Up series. This webinar series engages and enhances Boston's workforce as they manage their work and themselves during this COVID-19 pandemic. As we all navigate through this unprecedented time, many of us are finding ourselves honing skills to deal with the uncertainty in our work and in our personal lives. Today, we're gonna discuss how to coach employees through this crisis. We're lucky to have Professor Jim Pouliopoulos, again, better known as Pouli, of Bentley University here with us today. And he will lead us through this important and very timely topic. I do wanna start with just a few notes. First, this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared on the Chamber's YouTube page shortly after the presentation. We also hope these sessions are an opportunity for you to network. So we do request that you adjust your screen name by clicking on those three little dots in the top right corner of your own video box, and then click rename to include both your first name, last name, or your last initial, and any organization that you may be affiliated with. Our session today is going to be highly interactive, including a few breakout sessions. We will give you instructions along the way as to how to participate. I really invite you to stay engaged, and if at any time you'd like to use the chat function, please don't hesitate to do so. With that, I am pleased to introduce Pooley. Good morning, Pooley everyone. Is a... <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead, Jill. <laughs> no, no, please. I still want an introduction. <laughs> I, I wanted to give a little bit of, of your awesome background. <laughs> um, Professor Pooley here is a senior lecturer at Bentley University, and he's the director of professional, the professional sales program. Pooley delivers executive education workshops for professionals on communication, teamwork, and coaching. His three TEDx talks have explored the themes of inner motivation and career satisfaction. His book, How to Be a Well-Being, Unofficial Rules to Live Every Day, is going to be published by Wiley Publishing in July 2020. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I myself am actually uh, what Caitlin is calling a quad alumni here. So I'm a Bentley um, graduate for both the undergrad and graduate uh, program, as well as an alum of two of the Chambers programs, their Women's Leadership Program and their new All In for Advancement program, both of which were absolutely awesome. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Pooley, for joining us as well. We're very lucky to be able to learn from you on such a very important and timely topic. Great. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. Sorry that I, I jumped in there. I was so excited to get started. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, the topic uh, of coaching employees is something I, I'm, very, I'm very passionate about. Um, I worked as an executive coach for a number of years uh, before coming to Bentley as a full-time member of the faculty about eight years ago. Um, prior to that, I had worked at um, some large companies, GE and IBM, and some smaller companies uh, in the tech field. And one of the things that I, that I realized early on, I have two engineering degrees and I have an MBA from Bentley, so I'm a single falcon, if you will. But one of the things that I learned early on was that as much as I enjoyed uh, learning about engineering, I was actually better suited working with people than with technology. And so I declared myself a recovering engineer. 
and uh, left the technical field, went into sales and marketing. And then uh, it was really when I was at IBM that I had the opportunity to participate on the mentoring team, which was a, a group of nine of us that ran all the mentoring programs for the entire corporation. Um, at the time, IBM had just under 400,000 employees. And so that was really the, the, the first instance where I learned the, the power of coaching. Um, as we helped employees become better at coaching, uh, their um, direct reports, and then also developing mentoring relationships. So, um, so it was after those experiences that I that I started my own executive coaching firm, working with business owners and uh, technology executives, and and I've developed some additional material that we use now at Bentley for a lot of the executive ed workshops that we run. Um, we run a, a coaching workshop, for example, where we help people learn how to coach their employees. This quote that I have up here by Stephen Covey is one of my favorite quotes. And it's not just because he's another bald man. Uh, I, I think he's got some real great wisdom in the books that he's written. And um, I, really, I really think that coaching at its heart is just this ability to have a conversation with someone and have it feel like you're sharing each other's core values and understanding each other on a very fundamental level where you strip away everything external to it. The best coaching conversations I've ever had have been timeless. You know, the time has just kind of gone quickly, and you don't realize it until it's until it's over. Like how long you've been talking. Think about the first time you met a, a friend when you were younger, perhaps, and and uh, you may have talked, oh, you know, th through the entire night. That's a great example of sort of what a coaching uh, conversation can be like. Of course, we don't have you know all night to talk about these things, but that sense of timelessness is something that's really important in coaching. But the first thing I wanted to talk about was uh, having those kinds of conversations are really driven by your ability to understand the other person's communication style. And that's, and that's why we did this quick little poll as we started the meeting here, because one of the other areas that I focus a lot on is DISC, which is a personality assessment that's been around since 1928 and is really a very powerful tool for helping you understand how everyone else around you prefers to communicate. As I tell people very often, you know, the golden rule is very invalid. Uh, do unto others as you would have done unto you is not the way to communicate pe with people. You will find that most people have a different communication style than you do, especially if you're in a manager and um, direct report relationship. Uh, different personality types certainly will, will appear there. And so understanding what a person's, per you know, chosen method of communication and their style is important to being able to have these kind of coaching conversations that flow really well, but also which you put yourself in their shoes and understand how they want to communicate with you as opposed to trying to impose your style on them. So when we look at the, when we look at the framework of how um, people communicate and how people uh, are motivated, there's really two axes. There is the, you know, the horizontal one where, uh, where you're looking at guarded and controlled communication versus expressive and open communication. So in some ways, if, if, if you're on the left side of that framework, you're actually a little bit more tuned into tasks and deadlines and milestones. If you're on the right side of that uh, diagram, if you're expressive and open, you're, you're more tuned into people and relationships and feelings. And neither, neither side is better than the other. They're both, they're both valid ways of, of uh, communicating. And then when you look at the, at the vertical, the direct and action-oriented top piece here, those folks tend to be more extroverted, tend to be more action-oriented. You look at the bottom, more indirect and thoughtful, those tend to be more introverted. And when I say extroverted and introverted, just to make sure we have the right definition, extroverted people are not necessarily outgoing, they just get energy by being around other people. And introverted people are not necessarily um, you know, sort of not outgoing, they basically get their energy by being alone, but they certainly can work with, with others and work well with others. So I had you all uh, answer this poll question because I wanted to take a look at what your, uh, what your, what the makeup of this group was like. So I'm gonna share the results here on the screen just so we can take a little look. And it looks like people uh, that are expressive and open, uh, about 66%, 65% of you, so, so on the top half, if you will, on the, on the top half of that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the right side of that diagram, um, got a bit of a majority of people there with fewer people on the left guarded and controlled. 
And then the direct and action-oriented people on the top half, and, and fewer of you, well, it looks like one on the, on the bottom half of the diagram. Now, why this is important is, I want you to note, like, try to remember what your answers were and note where you ended up on this diagram. Because I think what we're gonna find is that your, the makeup of this group is different than the makeup of the general population to sort of prove the point that all of our styles are very different. So I'm gonna stop sharing that data for now. Just remember where you were on that, uh, on that matrix. I'm just gonna close this poll out. Okay, so DISC stands for, uh, the, the DISC uh, matrix, if you will, puts people into these one of these four quadrants. Now, similar to Myers-Briggs, and I know a lot of people have done the Myers-Briggs um, uh, personality test. The, the problem I've always had with Myers-Briggs is that it puts you into 16 different personality types. ENFP, ISTJ, INFP, and so forth and so on. And most people find Myers-Briggs to be very accurate about their personality, but very difficult to understand what somebody else's personality is and how to adapt your communication style to it. I find that DISC is very intuitive once you understand what the four quadrants stand for. And so I've laid out kind of where the, where the different personality types reside on this, uh, on this, ma on this matrix. So you're, you're one of these four types of personalities, basically. And, and when I say you're one of these four types of personalities, I don't mean you're always um, in that quadrant. You always have sort of a secondary uh, style as well. So uh, for example, my primary style is I, and we'll talk about what the I style means. But my secondary style uh, actually is a tie between the D and the S. And my weakest style is the C. And so when I communicate with someone who is a C type person, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment here, I really have to adjust my communication style dramatically in order to be effective in communicating with them. I work really hard at that um, when I can. So in terms of the population, and in terms of the general population, 14% of people are in that upper, um, upper uh, hemisphere, if you will, the direct and action-oriented people. Now on this call, just I'm gonna call back the results just briefly here so you can see them. On this call, on this webinar, we find that uh, we've got 94% of you are in that upper uh, quadrant. Now, the data that says that there are, you know, 14% of us that are direct and action oriented means that the people who've joined this call probably are direct and action oriented because there are, there are actually lots of managers, business owners, and executives that fall into the upper hemisphere of this chart. And so I'm not surprised to see that a majority of you are in that, are in that space. Um, then, of course, obviously, when you look at the, the, the balance of the population, they're in the they're in the indirect and thoughtful space. So if most of us on this call are direct and action oriented, then we really need to adjust our style when we're talking to pretty much the majority of people that surround us at work and in our social lives and in our families, for example. When you take it uh, to the next step, guarded and controlled, uh, we've got about 20% of the population in the guarded and controlled area and about 80% in the expressive and open area. So what, again, what this means is uh, on this call, most of us by a small, but you know, most of us by a two to one majority are expressive and open. Uh, and we will need to basically adapt our style for those of us on the call that are guarded and controlled. When you lay this out into a bit more of a, of a, of a descriptive matrix, these are the four different types of personalities that are out there. So the D, I, and S, and the C, these are, I picked three words for each one of these or three phrases that really sort of describes these personality types. So I'm gonna stop sharing the, the previous poll. Uh, and what I'm gonna ask you to do, I'm gonna give you a second poll now. I want you to, so think about what you picked as you were coming into the, into the webinar in terms of the poll that you answered. But now I want you to think about of the four of these descriptions, as you read them, which one do you think your friends and coworkers would describe you as? Which of these four, uh, which of these four types? So I'm gonna launch a second poll here. And I just want you to indicate which of those four types you think you are. I'll give you a, I'll give you a minute to do that while we're...
And, and again, when we're done with this poll, what we're going to do is take a look at what, is the, what are the percentages across the population and how this sampling of 27 uh, individuals, 25 to 27 individuals, um, matches you know, the general style of population. Okay, great. So we've got most of the results in. I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to set that off to the side here. And let's take a look at what the general pop population looks like. When you break the population down, 3% of people are D type personalities. These are dominant personalities. They like to be, to, to make decisions. They like to be in control. Typically, if you were to poll CEOs, business owners, senior management, a lot of these folks will be D type personalities. The I's are uh, considered influencing, enthusiastic, outgoing. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an I, which is why I love to teach. I love to speak in front of large groups, and, um, and only about 11% of the population are eyes. Um, one of the things I always joke about with people is that every year when they do polls of um, people's biggest fears, you know, spiders and, um, and disease and death and so forth and so on, the number one fear in almost every, um, in every poll is public speaking, which I always find interesting because like the number three uh, fear is death. And so that means that most people that I know would rather die than get up in front of an audience and speak, which is ironic, I think, because I love doing it for a living. So that's an I type personality. The S, which is most of the people that you will come into contact with are steady, social, stable uh, personalities. They like to work in teams. They don't necessarily like to be singled out, but they, but they are happy to be um, acknowledged for being a part of a team that's done something great and something successful. They love things to stay the same so that they can develop relationships and develop systems and work under the same circumstances. And since most people are S's and we're experiencing great change right now because of what we're going through, this is where a lot of people are going to struggle mentally with their well-being and their, and their sense of worth and their sense of, um, and their sense of uh, change. They don't like change, and we are experiencing change in every sector of, of business and in personal life. And then the C-type personality is a very, a very accurate, conscious of uh, policy and procedure, compliant to, to the way things uh, should be done. Now I'm going to share the results of the, of the poll that we just did and take a look at how we, as a group, break down. So we 20% of us are in the D category. 28% of us are in the I category, which is not surprising because as I said, most people that come to webinars that want to learn about how to manage employees and coach employees tend to be D's and I's because those are the people that gravitate to those kinds of leadership positions. Friendly, cooperative, and patient, but we've got about a third of us on this call that are in that category. Um, and then accurate, cautious, and have high standards, about 20%. Uh, and frankly, those, those in the C quadrant, have already added up those uh, percentages to make sure that they add up to 100. That's the C-type personality. Jill, this is this is your realm of accounting. <laughs> it, it's actually funny though, Polly, because I actually found myself in the D category, um, but I do think that, that that's quite a, a funny comment about the Cs. <laughs> I, I think I do work with a lot of them. <laughs> right. So. So uh, when I do these, you know, sort of day-long workshops around DISC, one of, the, one of the exercises that we do is that we get people to uh, break up into groups uh, by their style and, and do a quick uh, conversation around what that style means. So what I'd like to do right now, just briefly, a very short experiment, uh, I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. And I'll put about four or five people into each room. And I just want you to share with the people that are in your room what your personality style is like, and also talk a little bit about the people that you, because of your personality style, the people that you enjoy working with, the types of people, the styles of people you enjoy working with, and also the styles of people that you find uh, are a little more difficult to deal with, people that you maybe you have a little bit more conflict with. with. Um, and I'll give you about three to four minutes to do that in your breakout rooms, because I do want this to be a little bit uh, interactive. And when I pull you back from your breakout rooms, I'm going to have you just, I'm going to take a couple of volunteers to just tell me what they discovered in that short conversation, but really focus on your style and the styles of people that you have conflict with 
And by conflict, it, it doesn't have to be anything that is, um, that is truly very, very negative. I mean, even you could even talk about um, your spouse, your family, uh, siblings, parents, coworkers, people that you work with, just think of one or two people that you have sort of ongoing um, difference in style with. For, my wife and I are very different in our style. I'm an I, uh, my wife is more of a C and, and D, and so we, we just look at the world very differently. We have a great relationship because we kind of each understand how we approach things, but we each have to kind of work on our on our approach to communicate with each other. So that's the kind of thing I want you to focus on as I uh, put you into the breakout room. So these are gonna be just randomly assigned. Um, we've got uh, 27 participants. I'm gonna put you into, let's say, um, six different rooms. I'll do, I'll do seven rooms, that way we've got three to four participants in each room. So you will get a note to go into the breakout room, go into the room and just discuss how your style conflicts with other styles. Maybe pick one or two people that you know that you've had uh, communication issues with, uh, and also the people that you like working with, and we'll, and we'll uh, give you four minutes to do that. So I'm gonna... All right, everyone's, everyone's heading back. I think almost everyone is back. So give me some, um, those of you that have joined us, give me just a couple of, uh, I'll take some volunteers, give me some feedback on what you discovered about your style and maybe the types of people that you like or dislike to interact with. And, uh, and was there anything um, uh, enlightening about that brief conversation you just had? Hello. Nice to see you again. Good to see you too. So what did you, what did you, um, what did you learn or discuss in your room? Uh, so we discussed our styles and sharing uh, times when we absolutely could recognize that we were working with a different style and um, reflecting. I, I personally am reflecting on that as I go through a transition with my job. And my story was around my, a new director and um, at work that, and I've had many different directors that I've worked with, but she's clearly a D uh, and I'm an I. Okay. And that initial con conversation between the two of us my eye was very prevalent, right? I was talkative. Right. I was enthusiastic to meet her. I was trying to do all the right things. She's thinking about the competitive. You know, she's just come in. She's got right. to prove herself, right? She's got to make sure she's got that commitment from the team. And right out of the gate, that was Difficult. a evident gap. In That's the absolutely. That is, um, that is the kind of conversation that I have with these all the time. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask... Because uh, I know you're an I, and we could talk about this for hours. You know? <laughs> exactly. So right. I'm going to zip it. All right. Someone <laughs> told me that, uh, that Jason, you had some interesting insights. Jason, can I put you on the spot and ask you to give us some feedback? Yes, sure. Um, so we had an interesting conversation. Uh, so myself, I am more on the DNC side. And then right. one observation that I shared with the group was that uh, working remotely with uh, you know, my team, I'm kind of realizing the importance of sort of leaning a little bit more towards the other side, yes. kind of the, just, just so that the folks feel more connected. Yeah. So, you know, for example, like I'm just meeting with my team twice a week, even, even when there isn't anything sort of like work related necessarily to talk about. Uh, Cause I think that aspect of just, you know, the team feeling connected to each other, uh, in, 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 even just talking about like how we're doing at home, that, contributes a lot to how well the team works uh, together. So. Uh, that's excellent. I mean, that is exactly, um, sort of exactly what I was hoping um, I would hear in terms of the different types of uh, personalities and actually the, the, the adjustment that you're making as a, as a leader uh, to accommodate your, um, you know, your employees' individual styles. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on here, and, and I just want to, I want to give just sort of a quick overview of what these individual styles are probably feeling during this pandemic crisis. So the D type personalities we've, we've established are decisive and dominant personalities. And during this period of time, they're actually feeling a little bit of fight or flight. They wanna take control. They don't like to not have control. And this situation certainly has, has caused a lot of us to realize we don't have as much control as we would like. Um, and I think part of, part of what, uh, as, as a coach and a manager, you would like to uh, convey to the D types on your team is that you, you need to get them to kind of slow down a little bit 
and realize that not everyone go, goes at the same pace as they do. Um, and also allow them to kind of take control of areas where they might be innovative to help you come out of the pandemic um, in better shape. The eyes um, are panicking because when you say social distancing to an eye, it runs very counter to how we like to operate. And so um, what, what Jason was doing with his team is actually a perfect thing to do for folks on your team that are eyes, is communicate with them outside of it having to be about work, uh, encourage them to you know, have Zoom meetings with friends and family and FaceTime you know, with people like that. Um, and another thing for eyes that is, is interesting is ask them to put together a list, a victory list of things that they've done in the past where they've been um, given kudos by someone. It's a nice way of them to reflect on um, their value to other people in the past, even though they might not be feeling that as much right now. The S's, as I said in the opening, uh, are afraid of change. These people are definitely worried about change uh, that's coming. But I think what you need to emphasize with S type personalities during this period of time is yes, change is coming, but it's change in the way, in the way we do business in how we do business, not necessarily in why we're in business. And you have to get them to kind of, uh, embrace the fact that the, that the reasons they, that they, that they have gone to work in the past, the same reasons to be working from home and, and changing the way work is done. The other thing about S is, as I mentioned, is that they like to work in teams. And uh, this work from home thing is very isolating to S's. And it, and it can really begin to drag on them. So one company that I know of has done an excellent job of uh, embracing the S factor for some of their employees. During the day when they're working for an hour or two at a time, they actually set up a Zoom meeting like this, where, the, where all they're doing is just working. And they just happen to be able to see each other and make comments to each other, but it's not a meeting. There's no agenda. It's just an open Zoom meeting that allows S types to kind of be in a group because they really do need to work in a group. And then the C type personalities, they have um, uh, they have uh, 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 the worry the worry thing of the thing you have to worry about C type personalities is they might withdraw during this period of time. They like to work alone. They like to be in charge of process and. And, um, and, and as a result, they may, they may disengage a bit. And so you need to kind of help re-engage them and maybe engage them and their efforts in helping you um, process, create processes for going back to work. So that's a, just a quick you know, overview on DISC. And, um, and I don't want to go too much further into it because I do want to talk about coaching conversations uh, for the rest of the time we have together. So one of the things that I've often noticed is when I say when I say coaching, um, I, 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 get a lot of, um, I get a lot of feedback from people that is not coaching. So uh, coaching is not training and coaching uh, is not managing and it's not mentoring. And we use these words interchangeably. Training is sort of the, the delivery of knowledge and skills. Managing is the direction of activity and mentoring really is uh, a, a relationship where someone is sharing experience and pulling someone along with them, right? So those, those three terms are often used interchangeably and they're really not the same. Coaching uh, is a conversation. And it's, and it's important to note that it's a conversation that has an end result. And the end result in coaching is almost always some kind of behavior change. So when you're having a coaching conversation with someone, you're really trying to help them change their behavior. They're trying to either achieve a new result, they're trying to change the, the way that they interact with people or interact with work. But one of the things that, um, that is not coaching is you trying to solve their problem. So a lot of what you're doing in a coaching situation is basically trying to help them um, understand their problem, solve their own problem, and embrace the solution that they've come up with. You have to be curious, genuinely interested in the person. You have to let them lead the conversation and you have to coach the whole person, which is even more important nowadays than ever because coaching the whole person basically means allowing them to talk not just about work issues, but maybe issues they're having at home and financially and emotionally and the things that they're dealing with because of the pandemic. The framework that I like to use when I'm, when I'm conducting a coaching conversation is one that's been around for a long time. It's called the GROW framework. 
you're basically having a conversation with someone and asking them to kind of convey to you their goals. What are they, what are they trying to achieve? Uh, what's the current reality that they have? In other words, what is the relationship between where they are today and where they want to be in terms of a goal? What are the options to move forward? What are some of the things that they can do to try to begin a, uh, achieving that goal? And then the way or the way forward is, okay, of all the different options, which one are you going to focus on for the next period of time, whether it be a week, a month, and, and so forth. So that it's a very structured approach, and, and we explore quite a bit of it in the coaching workshop that we do. The one thing I did want to um, bring up was, you know, what kind of goals do people have in uh, a pandemic? And frankly, the, the, the thing that most people are, I find that most people right now are worried about um, three things, that they're experiencing three things. They have regrets, uh, potentially regrets over things that they didn't do before the pandemic hit, right? Things that, things that they perhaps regret not saying or doing uh, in a work situation, in a personal situation, uh, not taking on a responsibility. There are things they're looking back on and saying, I wish I, had, I wish I had taken this step. I wish I had done this differently. I wish I had treated people differently. There are fears, certainly. Fears of the unknown. When is this gonna change? When is this gonna end? How is this gonna change everything? And a big one is just feeling overwhelmed. They just need someone to help them kind of talk through all of it and figure out where, where is it, um, what are the things that I have under my control? So where are the things that I need to set aside? And where are some of the things that, um, that I need to kind of address immediately? I think when it comes to all of these, um, again, in talking to people that I've dealt with, I, I kind of made a little list for myself that I want to read off to you just in terms of um, the types of things you might hear from people around you. So we're dealing with the regrets, you know, professional or personal, um, career crisis. This is actually a time when a lot of people are, are second guessing their career choices. And so one of the things, one of the, there's two questions you could ask people during these coaching conversations that I think are really helpful. The first one is, what do you do well, but dislike doing? Because a lot of people do things well, and they've done it for a long time, but, they're, but they maybe are bored with it or dislike doing it. That is a warning sign that they might be approaching burnout. And especially now when we're working from home and it seems like everything is, um, blending together between work and home, they may be doing more of what they are good at, but don't necessarily enjoy. So maybe they need to think about what's their next step when things begin to clarify for us. The opposite of that is what do they think that they do poorly or would like to get better at, but actually enjoy doing? This is an opportunity for them to explore what, what area of growth they might want to uh, focus on as, again, as things begin to ease and we get back into the regular work-life balance. Um, sleep. There's a whole chapter in my book about sleep. It, there's a lot been written about it. It's amazing that uh, the, the health and mental well-being benefits that sleep has. All I'm going to say about sleep, because I can go on for a long time about sleep, is you have to get eight hours. And if you tell me that you don't need that much sleep, I'm telling you that you're shortchanging yourself. There's a lot of data around that. Big health benefits uh, to getting those eight hours. So find a way to do that. Um, and then the other thing is, in terms of dealing with the overwhelm or the feeling of overwhelm is people need an outlet. And people, I think, are afraid to let themselves start a new hobby, learn something new, spend more time with family, spend more time with friends. Because I think a lot of people are worried about what's going to happen to my job, to my company when we come out of this. And they're maybe a little too focused on work. And so they need to hear from managers and coaches that it's okay to relax a bit, to learn something new, to try something different. You have to have a, a quiet, confidential, trusting environment to have these kinds of coaching conversations. Uh, I would say, obviously, you're going to do a lot of this over Zoom or some other uh, web meeting platform. If you're using Zoom, for example, I would, I would have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone over Zoom, but I would use a password to just to make sure nobody else kind of wanders into that Zoom meeting by mistake because the people that you're speaking with need to have that sense of confidentiality and trust, and they want to feel like no one else is listening into their uh, conversation. Your job is just to ask great questions, just to ask people um, how they're doing, 
and dive a little deeper into it, be genuinely curious about the, the types of issues that they're having. And you could really kind of zero in on those regrets. You can use that as a topic and say, do you have any regrets? Do you have any, what are your fears? Where are you feeling overwhelmed? You can begin your conversation that way um, and let people know it's confidential. This is a little tricky if you're managing people and coaching them because when you're managing someone, you may not want to hear about their regrets and their fears and their sense of overwhelm. So you have to go into a little bit different mode. The open and spaciousness part of it, if, again, we're not really doing this now. We're not doing this face-to-face. -face. When I was coaching people um, you know, as part of my coaching firm, I would make sure we go to a coffee shop or go someplace that was quiet and uh, get away from the, from the normal um, craziness. I suppose you could even do this outdoors. You could find a place where you could have the, the appropriate social distance from each other and, and have a coaching conversation outdoor. I think one of the main things about coaching that gets lost is that you need to add some accountability. So at the end of the conversation, when that employee tells you this is the behavior change I'm going to try, these are the things I'm going to prototype in terms of new behavior, you need to have a next meeting already scheduled so you can check in and say, how did it go? Did you do it? Did you embrace this new way of thinking, this new thing, this new type of behavior? And if not, it's not, it's not your opportunity then to chastise them or uh, you know, sort of call them on the carpet. It's your opportunity to say, what happened? What changed in terms of your, um, your motivation to, to go after that goal? And, and then try to help them again, sort it out. This is really all about them making those commitments. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie, for all of all of the time today. It was a really insightful presentation, and I know I am walking away with a lot of ideas to bring back to my team. Um, but I do want to transition now to Q&A. We've gotten a couple of questions sure. come in over here. Um, if you haven't sent anything in the chat, I invite you to input your questions into that chat box now. Um, while you're doing that, I will start with um, one question that I have anyway, which is, how can I improve my ability to read my employees' personality type so that I can properly uh, tailor the, the yeah. coaching and the questions? This is a great. This is great, and it's actually a great. Um, it's a great hobby to have. I've adopted this hobby after you know after learning DISC many years ago. Now suddenly, when I meet people, I find myself acting almost like a detective. So, two things. <laughs> So one, you have to be very observant. Uh, when you observe someone physically, even on Zoom, you can see I'm doing a lot of this with my hands. I'm definitely someone who's in the upper hemisphere. I've got a lot of energy. I'm very physical in the way I communicate. Anyone who communicates like that, anyone who moves around a lot when they communicate is definitely in that upper hemisphere. Um, anyone who's a lot more sedate as they talk to you, with the hands by their side, maybe they don't have a lot of head movement, they're definitely more likely to be in the bottom half of that hemisphere. So first things first, are they an introvert or an extrovert? Figure that out. Then listen to how they talk. The second thing after you observe is listen to the words they use. If they describe a situation using terms like deadlines and budget and process and systems, they're probably on the left side of the, of the, of the matrix. So they're probably a D or a C. If they, think, if they talk about impact on people and emotions and relationships, if they use those type of words, then they're on the right side. And so the practice, I just tell people, practice with your family. Practice you know, with people that you know really well and, and start putting them into these boxes uh, in, mentally in your head. Uh, and eventually you get good at it. The other thing you can do is watch television shows where there are three or four main characters because one of the things that happens with these archetypes is that it, like on Friends, for example, you can go through the whole roster of the characters on Friends, and you know who the D types are and the I types and the S's and the C's, and you're just tuning yourself to, to look for those differences. So those are, those are some of the things I, I tell people to try. No, those, those are great tips. Um, thank you. So one of the other questions that I've received is, do you have any tips for how employees can integrate a lens of inclusivity into their coaching? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, it, um, and I think it's one, I find coaching to be one of those areas where um, two things happen. One, when you're having a great coaching conversation, if you get really good at this, you are no longer, you're, you're really stripped down to your core, right? So all the, all the issues of uh, equity and inclusion and diversity, and a lot of these things kind of strip away if you're doing the conversation really, really well 
because it's just two souls communicating is kind of how I, how I look at it. When I was working with clients, my goal was always just to get to the heart of who they were uh, internally, their values, their sense of direction, you know, regardless of all the other uh, elements uh, that make up their personality. So that's one thing. The second thing is, if you're doing a good job of a coaching conversation, you've created a space that is pretty safe. And so that's an area where you can explore some of these topics about equity and inclusion and gender and, uh, and identity, where they might be a little hesitant to kind of bring those things up externally in the workplace. But in a coaching conversation, if it's confidential, if there's trust between you and the person that you're, that you're coaching, they should be able to open up about their honest feelings about these things, talk about implicit bias and unconscious thoughts, uh, both you know, how they have treated other people and how they've been treated by other people. This should be an opportunity for them to really open up and explore these uh, topics. So again, they can change their behavior going forward if they feel like they need to. And I, and I, and I really think coaching is like one of these powerful sort of secret um, tools that people don't know they have. Right. We do a lot of training. And I know it, it can be difficult to get the, the people that you're coaching to open up to you. And just from my own experience that I'll share, I know that, you know, I really think that as the coach, you being vulnerable first really, really opens up the door for your coachee to start to feel as though right. he or she can also be vulnerable with you. I think that's an excellent observation. And I also think that's one of the things that the leaders that I'm watching right now that are doing a great job of, you know, kind of moving their organizations through this crisis have done exactly that, Jill, which is they've opened up about their own insecurities about this and their own, they're very transparent about what they know and don't know about the situation uh, and their own feelings about it. And, and I think, you know, I think people need to be more human and open up about these things and not, not put it in a box off to the side, right? It's front and center. So I think that's true. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Come so in? one of the uh, questions we've actually gotten a couple couple people with this question is, how do you handle conflict over Zoom? Um, one was directed specifically at conflict with someone who may fall into the S quadrant. And another question was even just more broadly, to the extent you do have conflict or a difficult conversation, how do you do that over Zoom? It's obviously not the same as sitting face to face in your office with someone or a coffee shop. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think I think um, I, I think when I think about conflict and conflict resolution, especially in terms of the disc personality types, which is a huge part of it, people have conflicts um, in a couple of different ways. So when you're talking about uh, different personality types, there's two kinds of conflict that occur. One is the conflict of pace. So the people in the upper hemisphere of the disc, the D's and the I's move faster than the people in the S's and the C's. The S's and the C's are more thoughtful. The D's and the I's are more action oriented. So conflict sometimes arises because either the D's and the I's are frustrated that the S's and the C's don't want to move as quickly, or the S's and the C's feel a little um, uncertain about how quickly the, the D's and the I's are, are moving. And again, D's and I's typically you know, are very often are leaders, and S's and C's very often are direct reports, and so they're being pulled along. So recognize maybe where the conflict is coming from. If it's a conflict of pace, you need to adjust your pace. Either you need to move a little faster out of your comfort zone or slow down to, to bring people along. The other conflict that occurs is relationships versus tasks. So the right is the relationship part of the matrix. The left side is the, is the uh, task oriented side of the matrix. Um, the conflict that occurs there is folks on the left who want to get stuff done are not taking into account that the people on the right want to make it fun or at least or at least comfortable for other people and so the conflict sometimes occurs there you know one example i use in my workshops is if you're a ceo and you are an i or an s and you're faced with this crisis that we have right now your first reaction is probably thinking can i get everyone in the company to take a 10 percent pay cut so we can keep everyone employed if you're on the D and the C side, your first reaction might be, how do I cut 10% out of the budget? Does it mean I let 10% of my people go? Does it mean I, I look for dollars here, there, or anywhere else? It, it, and, it's not that you're, and it's not that you don't care about people, it's just that your, your decision-making style is on the numbers, the tasks, and the bottom line, 
Whereas on the right side, it's about people and conflict happens there as well. And the worst conflict comes when it goes across the matrix. I's and C's, D's and S's have the worst pairs of conflicts. D's move fast and they're very bottom line oriented. S's want to move slow and take their time and make decisions slowly. And so you can see how that, if it's pace and priority. And so recognizing those things, you could do it over Zoom. You could, you could just, just adapt your style for the person that you're trying to communicate with. And that's why I think it's important to begin with understanding the other person's style. Absolutely. So there's a couple more questions and then I think we're going to get to closing remarks. So if we could quickly hit on these two. Sure. Um, the first is, do you recommend that the manager and the coach are two different individuals? Great question. I think, I think you can, I think managers as coaches is sometimes uh, uh, problematic as you can imagine. Right? So I think managers could work together to identify coaches for their employees. So I think anyone can coach anyone, frankly, you don't have to be in any kind of a direct report um, framework. And uh, I think managers who realize that they can't really coach their own people um, could offer to swap direct reports with another manager and, and just kind of have these ongoing coaching conversations. I, that's a great question. No, you don't have to be the same person. And often it's better not to be. Great. And then just the last one before a closing remark is, um, you know, how might we navigate challenges of a manager employee relationship when coaching would be helpful to the employee, but they are perhaps challenging the coaching um, or responding in a somewhat awkward fashion. Right. So I think this is one of those areas where when you, when you adopt a coaching mindset, you don't have to tell the employee they're being coached. Right. So I think sometimes when you say, listen, I want to coach you, there's a lot of pressure there, right? What do you mean you want to coach me? <laughs> might not, be a wall oh, that goes up. I don't need a coach, right? I just want to do my work. So you don't even have to say it's a coaching conversation. You just say, hey, hey can we take 10 minutes? I want to talk to you about some stuff. And then open up those, with those questions about how they're doing regrets and fears and overwhelm. And then when you have that coaching conversation at the end of it and they say, you know what, I think I would like to try doing things this way or whatever. At that point, say, great, how about we talk again in two weeks? Let's see how it goes. You never have to say it's a coaching conversation because sometimes that, that turns that's, people out. It's too much pressure. That's great advice. Right. So in, in 30 seconds or less, I'll just ask if you have any final remarks to kind of wrap things up because I do want to be sensitive to everyone's yeah, time at right. the top of the hour. 30 seconds. It's hard to wrap all of this up, but listen, <laughs> just uh, tr lis listen to understand, not to respond to people. That's number one, right? When you're talking, having a conversation with someone, think about how you're just listening to understand where they're coming from and then try to adjust your communication style to them. And then don't get too wrapped up in the whole thing about this is a coaching conversation or not. Just have a conversation and try not to solve their problems, but just to ask good questions and, and see how much you can get out of them. If, you've, if you do those few things, you can start becoming a, a better sort of intuitive coach on your own. That's what awesome. I would well, thank you so much for your time and for all this insight during this you know, crazy time that we're living through. I know I have a few takeaways that I will be taking away with me. I was you know, writing some down here, um, especially, you know, I think I have a lot of people in the S quadrant. I'm in the completely opposite quadrant. So definitely need to be thinking of some good coaching questions myself. Um, and then be before I let everyone go, Cooley does have a special surprise for our guests. As I mentioned at the beginning today, he does have a book being released this summer titled How to Be a Well-Being, Unofficial Rules to Live Every Day. And it includes the 22 lessons guide this crazy game called life. And so be on, in honor of the 22 lessons, um, we're going to be giving away the book to our 22nd registrant, which is lucky number uh, 22 is Jason Wang from Federal Home Loan Bank. So congratulations, oh, Jason. Congrats, Jason. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. And thank you for that, Cooley. You're very and, welcome. And if, if you guys like this session, definitely stay tuned. Um, the Chamber is going to be partnering with Bentley in the future to bring um, all of the Chamber members more practices that can help you to be a more inclusive manager, especially during this challenging time. 
Um, and, and before I let you go, I know we're at the top of the hour, I did want to also note that the chamber has a packed digital calendar. So there are skill up series just like this every Friday via webinar. Um, they are going to be taking a break next week for Memorial Day weekend, but uh, we'll be back on May 20th. 29th for how to build resilience and plan during COVID-19. And you can learn more about all of the different chamber sessions that are going on at bostonchamber.com. And you can sign up for their newsletter there or also follow them on all the different types of social media. So thank you again, everyone for joining. Thank you fully for all of this awesome insight. And uh, I hope you all stay safe and well. Signing off now.